Just going out on a limb here, if I'm understanding you, you're saying that there is a, a possibility that just the, the sheer volume of this stuff that's being used is tied to the massive increase we're seeing in the numbers of people with like obesity and diabetes. This is Generation Health. Every week we bring you the latest in news, cutting edge research, and time-tested best practices helping you live a longer, healthier life. Sitting opposite me, Mr. Joey DiMatteo, PharmD, board certified clinical nutritionist. I remembered that from without looking at my notes. You got it down now. I did. Well, let's not say that. <laughs> uh, there's always next week. How are you? Very good, sir. How are you today? Uh, I'm good. I'm good. I'm stretched, warmed up. I think. Ready to go. We'll see if I stumble over my words. Sitting behind third mic, Mr. Josiah Schweinberg, engineer. How are you, my friend? You left off extraordinaire this time. Well. Uh, judging on last on your performance last episode. <laughs> we're just kind of <laughs> trying to keep we'll the, drop uh, the extraordinaire. I'm, I'm ego doing Ego in check. I'm humbled. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. No, you're extraordinaire. We love you. Wow. I'm sorry. I'll remember next time. Forgiven. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, <laughs> Joey, what are we talking about? You're sitting here going, hey guys, let's get back to the show. <laughs> Today is plant-based organic food uh, and pesticides. Okay. So I know in a previous episode, we discussed um, meat and mm -hmm. relative to organic food and more of a hormone exposure end. Um, this time we're sticking to plant-based food. Organic will be, play a large role in what we discuss. Um, GMOs certainly are very important. I believe they're more of an episode unto themselves, but again, today keep the focus on pesticides. Okay. All right. I'm, I look forward to the GMOs one. Cause that's a, uh, that's a question I've long had lots of conversations yeah. we had there first though. Let's talk about what's happening behind the counter. Uh, it's impossible to know how many lives have actually been saved due to the accidental discovery of penicillin in 1928. But it is safe to say hundreds of millions. Aside from directly fighting infections, they make things like surgery much, much safer. Modern antibiotics really only use two primary methods to defeat infections, weakening the cell wall or damaging the DNA of the bacteria. Unfortunately, over time, bacteria is adapting to those and becoming resistant. We actually talked about that uh, a little bit in the last episode about uh, organic food. But there is a new frontier in this war being opened, and it's being opened by machine learning. Researchers at the University of Mass Medical School used machine learning to examine how dozens of non-antibiotic drugs also managed to destroy bacteria. These are drugs used for everything from depression, uh, and diabetes to parasite infections. The researchers grew hundreds of generations of mutant bacteria that were antibiotic resistant. And then, as Mariana Noto Gullion said, she's one of the researchers, and I'll just let her talk for herself quote, sequencing the genomes of bacteria that evolved and adapted to the presence of these drugs allowed us to pinpoint the specific bacterial protein that a drug used to treat parasite infections then targeted to kill the bacteria. Importantly, current antibiotics don't typically target this protein, unquote. So in other words, the researchers were able to identify the new novel methods that these drugs use for attacking the bacteria. While this doesn't mean that you will be prescribed an antidepressant to fight an infection, it does open new avenues of research for developing antibiotics that will expl exploit those weaknesses. And it was all made possible by machine learning, which I think is pretty cool. And in totally unsurprising research, a team at Ruhr University Bochum in Germany and the Netherlands Institute for Neuroscience has created a new meta-analysis of 212 previous studies involving over 13,000 people to confirm that hugs are in fact fantastic for both physical and mental health. Touch reduces feelings of pain, depression, and anxiety in both children and adults. Touching the head or face seems to have the biggest impact, but all touch is good. Newborns benefit far more from the touch coming from a parent, while adults seem to benefit nearly equally regardless of how well they know the person. One interesting side note from all of this 
in, uh, inanimate objects like body pillows and weighted blankets can provide some of the same physical pain relief benefits, but not the psychological ones. This was all borne out in this meta-analysis of all these different studies. Once again, science is showing us what we already knew, but now we have data to back it up. I think those sorts of studies are super fun, which is why we covered them. This is good news for me. I'm a big hugger with my three young children. So yeah. it reinforces that for me. I like, I like to hear that. Absolutely. Absolutely. It is. Um, I mean, everybody knows when somebody's in pain in the hospital or something like that, you hold their hand, you know, you touch their arm. It just makes a difference. And it's, we don't, we don't know. I mean, we kind of know how it works, but why it works that way. It almost implies that we aren't meant to do this life thing alone, that we should have other people around. Yeah. I, I read something that said, if you're going to hug someone or if you're affectionate with your spouse or whatever, it, like do it longer than six seconds. Yep. Six hmm. seconds is the key. Yeah. Some about oxytocin getting released in the brain and yep. interesting. Yeah. At, at like six seconds or more. Yep. Now you don't want to do that with just random strangers, <laughs> but especially with, not without permission. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The article that, uh, the main article I referenced talked about consent quite a bit, but you know, that they're should just be covering, a, they're just covering we should yeah understand that yeah get permission before you hug someone especially for six seconds anyway <laughs> we'll not take a hug break right now joey talk to me about plant food yeah or food from plants see i'm gonna say it plant wrong based food plant-based foods there we go so i guess just kind of to start you know like what's the goal here right um we're going to talk about pesticides. Probably, if you're listening to this show, just in general, probably know they're not great for you. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> Organic food, you probably, probably pretty good for you. So, uh, you know, that's kind of going to be the ultimate uh, take here. And you're like, wow, I'm going to sit through this show. And, and <laughs> that's what you're going to tell me. Thank you. Similar to kind of the, the tone I had last time. But again, the goal here is just to solidify, add color to some nuance and substance to what are essentially decisions that you're making. Why are you doing this? F organic food, we all know the price of groceries, where that's gone. So now Wild. you're adding this whole layer. So I, I cause ultimately that that's a lot of what um that this is gonna come down to is yeah, I, I would choose organic every time except for the availability, except for the cost. So um, okay, so mm -hmm. just foundationally again, uh we talked about organics last time. That was with meat and dairy. Yes. When we're talking about uh vegetables or fruits, plant-based foods. What does organic mean? So um, the USDA certifies it and they um, define it as foods that are grown and processed according to specific guidelines. Okay. So there's soil quality, um, animal raising practices, pest and weed control, which is obviously what we're going to hit on. Yep. Also use of additives. Okay. okay. So um, produce can, produce can be called organic. If it's, produce. That's yes, the word we can use. There you go. We'll call it produce for the rest of the show. <laughs> produce. I'll remember. So it's certified to have grown on soil that has no prohibited substances applied for three years prior to harvest. So okay. You can't just overnight decide you're going to be an organic farmer. Okay. So you can't just go organic overnight. Correct. Yes. Three years uh, minimum time there. So uh, as science is developing, there are constantly new fertilizers, new pesticides that are coming out. So um, in those cases, it must first be approved according to more broad criteria. I don't really see the use of going into it gets, gets pretty detailed, but, sure. um, you know, again, this is occurring all the time. There's new, there's companies that make a lot of money, um, synthetic and natural pesticides, um, you know, or their business. So it must be approved first if you want to maintain that organic seal and certification. Okay. So we're talking about, so pesticides just start to there for just a second. Mm -hmm. We use pesticides because we're growing a thing and we don't want the bugs or the animals or whatever eating the crop. Yes. And we don't want disease getting into it and all that. We, we need it to grow so that we can sell it. Yes. And efficiently. So, right. Uh, you know, a lot of these things, we're still talking about business here. So it, we want them to grow efficiently and safely. Um, by definition, they are used to prevent crops against insects, weeds, fungi, other pests. Okay. So pest in the broad definition mm -hmm. makes sense. And you're saying that there are some pesticides that are acceptable and some that are not? Correct. Okay. According to organic standards, okay. um, that's kind of what, what we'll touch on. There are certainly levels and things like that um, that are more broadly have been banned, et cetera, over time. And I'm kind of sticking to what's the difference. If you're making, if you're making the decision between what's quote unquote legal and conventional produce, what, what's that next step? Um, and in the pesticide case, um, they must be natural and, um, and they must be approved. Um, if, if, you know, new, um, inventions, new products come on the market. Sure. 
Okay. So take me through that. Tell me, tell me what we're talking about. Give me some details. Yeah. So we'll kind of start with kind of a framework here. Um, I got this from a study, but I really like there's a PhD nutritionist, three pillars of risk related okay. to this subject. How much of the stuff are we really getting on our food? How much of the stuff are we then ingesting? And how bad is the amount that we're ingesting? So again, pesticides are harmful in various ways. We know that, but how much of them are really end up on our food? How much of them do we then ingest? And then how much actually can cause those negative side effects and negative health concerns that we know can occur? Right. Just because you got exposed to it once doesn't mean that you're going to have whatever the side exactly. effect is. Exactly. It's very it. easy to put a headline that, that XY pesticide does Z. Um, the issue is how much. And right. I, I'm not pretending that I'm solving that issue for you. Just again, trying to get some nuance and some, some substance to what we know generally as a black and white fact, what, right? What's the middle ground? If you take whatever, even the most organic, healthy pesticide and inject it straight into a lab rat, mm -hmm. it's going to have a tumor and die because it shouldn't have that much in there at all. Right. We're not talking about that. Got it. Okay. So those are the three pillars. What's next? So, I mean, again, it still is important. Just again, this is another direct quote. Pesticides are chemicals that are specifically designed to kill living organisms. All Makes right. Sense. So we'll kind of start with one that um, uh, glyphosate. It's better known as Roundup. I was just going to say, yes. we've written articles about that one. Yeah. So it's um, by definition, a broad spectrum systemic herbicide. So it's a weed killer. Yep. Okay. And I don't know, this is not agriculture in general is not my area of expertise in any way, shape or form. So I kind of thought this glyphosate has, is all, all, has all this controversy. Um, I know that weeds are bad in terms of my lawn looks bad. My mulch bed looks bad, but like why, why risk these potential negative health consequences for weeds? So right. I, I had to look that up for me. Um, weed, and it's very simple money. Weeds cause significant losses in crop yield and the quality of the crop. So that for me, I needed to know that I yeah, couldn't understand. They're absorbing nutrients that the plants would otherwise be mm -hmm. the, the money plants would be yield using. and quality makes sense. Okay. So, you know, along with glyphosate, and again, this is kind of just background when they're making a product like Roundup, it's not, you know, glyphosate dissolved in water, okay? There are other chemicals in there. And that's what complicates so many of these studies. You could look at this individual glyphosate, individual ingredient, and you can attribute certain issues to it, certain health concerns. But then there's other chemicals in there that then, what are their levels of toxicity? What so you know what I mean? There, it, it's a it's complicated on so many levels. Um, but one one thing that I did find interesting, and I think um, is beneficial to know, is that what's added to Roundup um, and a lot of other pesticides are uh, chemicals known as surfactants. So what surfactants do is they help maintain surface tension and surface contact between two unlike substances. So in this case, keeps a liquid and a solid in contact with each other longer. So it can work better, work longer, more efficient product. That makes sense. And so the surfac so is this one of those things where maybe glyphosate in and of itself probably isn't awful, but the surfactant added in, all of a sudden it becomes a substantial issue. Glyphosate in and of itself is an issue, but yes, now you're just you're just adding Compounding. fuel to the fire. Got I, it. I would maybe yeah. Add a little twist to that, sure. but yes. I'm speaking completely ignorantly. No, here. yeah. So it was just, just some basic like headline takeaways. 81% of Americans have been exposed to glyphosate recently. Okay. Um, the volume wow. that's used and applied to crops has increased 100 fold since the late seventies, so just in that amount of time. 100 fold? Mm-hmm. Glyphosate resistant crops were introduced in 1996, which only kind of increased the market and effectiveness for Roundup. So again, you, you're killing the weeds and not not the, not the crops much more efficiently through these GMOs, so, so essentially. So just slather it on. Mm -hmm. Got it. It's not going to cause any harm to your product. Um, it's the most widely used herbicide in the world. Um, I think it's critical to touch on too. In 2023, so just last year, um, Bayer stopped selling it. There really? was, yeah, there was a lawsuit. I believe it was $80 million that was settled and 
they decided to get out of the roundup business. So wow. does this mean that's the one I'm starting with and it's the roundup and it's the lawsuit and they stopped so that this is the evil one and it's, it's, it's gone away and there's other makers of it. There's, you know, <laughs> there's much more to it than that. But again, um, that that's again, just where kind of I wanted to start there. Okay. So you talked about the three pillars, how much goes on the plant, how much is ingested and then how much of what is ingested is, is dangerous. Yeah. Tell me about, can you walk me through that with glyphosate? Sure. Sure. Um, so we'll start with, um, clouding it more and making it more difficult. The U S acceptable daily intake of glyphosate, 1.75 milligrams per kilogram of body weight in the European union. It's 0.5. Oh, so two large significant governing bodies have about three and a half times different level of intake that they um, think that is they, acceptable that they view safe. as acceptable. So <sighs> when you're trying to conduct a study, let alone evaluate a study that's got its own potential issues and, and biases or flaws. And then you're looking at even something like that. We have, we still don't know what is, what the standard is. Wow. Okay. So the, the world health organization in 2016 has determined that glyphosate is probably carcinogenic. <laughs> the EPA and our, our, our United States here maintains that it's not likely so again, these, these are the biggest bodies. So we're, we're, we're just going through what we've been told and trying to make the best decisions we can from there. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, and when, we, obviously it's been massively increased how much is used mm -hmm. and, and on when it's ingested, how much of it are we typically getting? Is it, you can't wash it off? Um, it is difficult to. So for example, there um, went through a study that um, looked at different grains, dairy, fish, fruits, vegetables, um, and attributed different percentages of, of glyphosate that was found. Actually, this, this one was more broad, was, was pesticides in general. So, um, for example, in fruits and vegetables, only 18, I'm sorry, for fruits, only 18% of samples didn't have pesticide residue. Wow. And for vegetables, it was 35, 38% that had no um, residue. Okay. When you go to something like meat and dairy, you're up in the 99s. Wow. So it, it's, it's on our, it's on our food. That's, that's for sure. Um, now how much of it is, um, that's where it can get a little complicated. So the maximum level for, for glyphosate related to soybeans, um, here was determined to be 18.5 that was found parts per million. So just a different unit there. Mm -hmm. um, the maximum level that they found when they analyzed 300 sample, uh, samples of soybeans was 18.5. The tolerance is 20. So there are certain soybeans that you get, you're going to be bumping up against that tolerance. Yeah. There were other samples of soybeans that were 0.265. So where, where you're getting your food, potentially, is it a smaller farm? Those kind of things, even if they're not organic, can have a variance. Again, 0.26 to 18.5 with just a sample of 300 different sources of soybeans. And again, the, with the, um, the maximum level that was found of, of 18 is really up against what's already a not exactly crystal clear value of upper limit. Okay, and, and you said, and I know we're, we're talking about produce, but you mentioned meat and dairy having it in there. Is that, is that the produce that's fed to the animals that's, it's then no, and again, it's uh, at this point, I for that for those lower numbers. So, if it, again, for meat, it was 99.77 percent had no residue. Okay, it would probably literally be contact. Okay, it's, it's okay. produced in a facility, it's contact. Dairy was 97.4. And remember, with dairy, um, you know, there's I, I think a little maybe a little more likelihood that they, they would come into contact with, sure. with other things, uh, let alone meat that's obviously uh, under skin, et cetera. So yeah, we, it's, 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 it's negligible. I think it was in there more for comparison. Got it. The, and there are more I could read here. That yeah. Canada, Canada did, you know, their own evaluation of 3,100 samples of vegetables, fruit, and grains, 30% of them, um, had glyphosate, but 1.3% of them were above the maximum level level that they have set. So we know that it is in our, it's, it's on, it's on these products that, so that, that you're bringing home. So to some extent, even if I wanted to get away from glyphosate, I may not be able to. Correct. Um, again, unless you're eating organic, the, these are all conventional, um, products that they're, that they're looking at here. So we know it's on there. Okay. Um, and again, I'm not here to say that the amount that's on there, 
my opinion of it is any better than what the EU says. So again, it, it's on there. What, what do we do right off the jump? Organic is going to eliminate uh, glyphosate exposure. They, they can't use it. And again, the soil for three years. Okay. So um, there are other classes of, there are a ton of, of different pesticides. <laughs> Um, but another class that is significant, and again, this is a nice dovetail with what the difference is between organic and non-organic, um, uh, pyrethroids or pyrethroids. Um, they're a class of pesticides that are derived from chrysanthemum flowers. All right. So, I love chrysanthemums. So, <laughs> so to make them drugs or um, like, like permethrin, um, they are synthetic versions of those. And it's kind of been mimicked. And so it could be patented and marketed. marketed. Sure. And then there are naturally occurring ones. So the nat- you say, why doesn't everybody just use the natural ones? Well, the natural ones aren't quite as effective. The natural ones degrade a lot quicker. You have to apply it a lot more. Um, the natural ones, and we'll go into a little bit later, are not necessarily totally free of any issues themselves. Mm. So again, it, there's there's a lot of levels here. So in the pyrethroids, there was a 2019 study done in JAMA um, for internal medicine, and they found that um, people with the highest level of exposure to these types of pesticides were three times as likely to die from cardiovascular disease during a 14 year um, study of their exposure. Wow. Yeah, this was done um, again over about the median follow up time um, was 14 and, a half, 14 and a half years, 14.4. Okay. They used a study of what they called nationally representative survey. So it was adults 20 years and older. Um, and they looked at, um, they, you know, got certain. Uh, cardiovascular markers and and looked later at at outcomes and again they they went with the biggest outcome of all death and they specifically wanted to see what was related to cardiovascular death um so it, this is not a perfect study by any means um with studies like this again at it, it a quick look um it's very jarring that's a big number it's there was a lot um uh, there were a few thousand participants in this study, so they, you know, they, they, it was significant in its scope. Um, but we're back to what we talk about a lot whenever we're talking about more quote controversial type subjects um, is correlation, not right. causation. Right. So there's plenty of smoke here. Um, we're not sure that there's a fire, um, but you know, what do what do we do with it with, with it once once we see things like this? Yeah. Is that one, say it again, pyrethroid? Pyrethroids is the broad class. Yes. Is, is that, how does Europe handle that? How does the U.S. handle that? Is it totally cool? We don't worry about it? Yeah, I mean, they have, they have levels set. Okay. Um, I didn't dig into the specific level difference in this one like I did with glyphosate, but um, natural mm-hmm. are permitted in organic. The synthetic analogs are not. Oh, interesting. Okay. So this is a good example of where exactly the, okay. Of where a line is drawn, but a line that's pretty close. They they have similar mechanisms, et cetera. So, and you're saying that even the natural form is not without question. Correct. Yes. And that's, and that's one that even if you're getting organic, you still may be exposed to very likely. Wow. Yeah. Because they, I mean, organic farmers have less options, right? Yeah. They have to use what they've got. Mm -hmm. Okay. You got others? Yeah. So, um, there are, um, other concerns, not just, um, you know, the carcinogenic aspect that we touched on, which is critical, but but again, very, very controversial. Um, there are endocrine and neurological concerns, Hmm. um, with various pesticides. Um, so for example, in 2016, um, a meta-analysis, so basically a study of studies, yep. Um, had some conflicting results, but ultimately found a significantly significant link between pesticides and an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. Oh, lovely. So we're not sure of the exact mechanism, um, but they listed multiple um, different pesticides. So this this was broad in terms of what they were looking at. Paraquat, Dieldrin, organochlorine-based, organophosphate-based. Um, so they looked at all of these. They found, um, when digging in kind of into the mechanism, particularly of these ones, they induce oxidative stress, mitochondrial dysfunction. Well, those are both things we don't want in our bodies. Mm-hmm. And so it makes sense that you wouldn't want those from a pesticide. Oh gosh. Yes. Okay. This is really depressing, Joey. <laughs> I think another important, um, again, cause this can be where you read a particular study and you, you know, jump hardcore. This is, you know, this is, you know, where I'm going to kind of hang my hat on this issue. 
Um, and it has to do with exposure. What degree of exposure? So we're primarily talking about ingesting it via food. That's where 99% of us, that's the world we're concerned about, the world we right. live in. Right. Um, but agricultural workers, and I think it's important, you know, because they are exposed at yeah. a much higher level and also still to just give you the ceiling on what these can cause. So um, there was a study done in 2012 that looked at agricultural workers who are using essentially spraying, um, spraying the crops. They, they found everything from multiple, they called central nervous system manifestations, headache, fatigue, tension, irritability, irritability, insomnia, dizziness, depression, difficulty, concentrating, poor balance. So it's getting very neurological, um, peripheral neuropathies, abnormalities, and even skin, I'm sorry, in knee and ankle reflexes. Wow. Um, and then other issues, numbness of skin, twitchings and arm, twitching in arms of legs, arms and legs, tremors, blurred vision, change in smell and taste. They, they documented that across, um, across the study. It, now, if memory serves, the glyphosate uh, lawsuit was somebody who was spray, it was primarily somebody who was yes. spraying it all the time and ended up with some crazy cancers or something. Exactly. So this is the same sort of function. These are people who are exposed to it a great deal. Correct. They're not necessarily eating it, although I'm sure they're probably doing that too. We're talking about people on the extreme end. Hopefully most of us aren't dealing with that. Right. But you're saying this is what we're ultimately looking at potentially. Sure. And again, I'm not saying that, that we just are all lumped into this category. I just kind of term it again. It's kind of the ceiling of, yeah. of what, of what these things can do and what, what we're dealing with and why even low exposures can still potentially be an issue as you make decisions of what, what you're eating. And so let's just say I take my vegetables home and I wash them thoroughly. Let's say I scrub my vegetables. What's to say that I'm not, how can I know that I'm not getting this, this stuff off of there? Yeah. I mean, we can go into that a little bit with, you know, what types of fruits and vegetables tend to be, you know, I'll go through a little bit of that classic, like clean and dirty dozen. Sure. Sure. Um, but it's important to know that that outer layer, um, especially the, especially these pesticides that have those surfactants again, there, there are chemicals in there that are making them bind. Okay. And fruits and vegetables are porous. We're not talking about a countertop. Okay. Right. So even whenever you're still much better off, you're washing off dirt, you're washing off bacteria, sure. um, whatever, whatever, you know, um, you decide to do just water's fine. There's different things that are, you know, you can swear by, or that one study says, I don't think it's critical. I think wash your, wash your fruits and vegetables. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But there is still, there's still an absorption extent that you cannot get rid of completely, particularly when you look at individual fruits and vegetables. Okay. All right. Do we have more? What, uh, what else? Give me some more just bad kinda news. Just kind of going to hit some different levels, levels to it here. Effects on men. Um, there was a study done that showed that there is a decrease in sperm count for men that are exposed to these. Um, it, it was broad in the sense of they looked at um, not just agricultural workers or anything like that. This, this was brought in its scope of kind of average everyday men. Um, and they found that there was definitely a link in lower sperm counts. Cool. Um, wonderful. <laughs> I think another key thing and this, this also, I think kind of from a tone or theme standpoint links with when we talked about, uh, meat and organic meat and hormones, um, with children, there, the bar of which you have a concern about issues or which there's a, when there's a uh, increased likelihood for issues is, is unfortunately lower. It's easy. Yeah. It's easier to, to cause them in children. So there was a study in 2010, um, and they looked at organo, organophosphate, uh, pesticides, and they found an increased link, um, in ADHD diagnosis. So they looked at over 1100 children and again, they did their best to get a representative general uh, population and 119 children met the diagnostic criteria um, for ADHD, ultimately at the, at the end of this study. And they found that this study found a 10%, um, uh, sorry, a tenfold increase in a specific um, metabolite, DMAP, that, that, was higher in that population. So why, why there was a tenfold increase in the concentration of this metabolite, we're not sure, but we know that that metabolite 
was linked to more directly to the, the 119 out of the 1100 that ultimately were diagnosed with ADHD. Wow. Um, so it was, again, statistically significant. Back to what I mentioned before, it's just important to understand why um, children's organs, not just brain, but all their organs are not fully developed until later in life. You're, you are potentially adding in chemicals that are affecting a growing um, not a finished product organ in, in this case. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's very critical in, um, you know, perinatal development. So what a mother is consuming while she's pregnant and while your children are young, it's in, and I think the other thing too, kind of while we're just going at this topic as a whole is, um, the role of outside, um, whenever kids are outside and you have a lawn that has been treated. So the more, make sure that you can give at least a couple days from whenever their spray's done, but be aware of all those things. When you're taking your kids to a park and things like that, yeah. that can, and that's where back to the agricultural workers, it's not going to be that prolonged day to day, but th they could get more. And I don't have a number for you, but the exposure from, you know, being outside for a few hours on recently treated park yeah. lawn versus what maybe they consume over the course of months can be comparable. I don't think that's, that's hard to believe at all. Um, so again, there's, that's just critical things to, to be aware of as you look at this overall and with children back to the kind of the immature organs, the livers and excretory systems are all, they're just not where adults are. So even, even with similar exposures or when you have something like, um, these upper limits, which as we said, can vary upper limits are uniform. A, an upper limit for a child would be very different. Yeah. Again, immature livers, smaller body weight overall. There's no, there's no differentiation made for a young human versus an older human. Wow. Okay. Uh, this, this is, this is incredibly depressing. I'm, I'm very concerned now. I was not before I thought ah, I'm eating fruits and vegetables. <laughs> I'm good to go. Now I'm feeling like I need to eat everything organic. Yeah. Unfortunately, they can also, um, pesticides also are endocrine disruptors at the level of obesity and diabetes. So I'm not sure of what the mechanism is, um, but there are studies that have shown that there is a link to, again, they, they use the term programming for obesity and diabetes. Also found there's a link to early puberty related to pesticide exposures. Oh, you said early, it's, it's programming for obesity and, and diabetes, meaning the exposure to these things is making you more likely to develop these life altering, uh, negative outcomes. Yes. They, they say it can lead to, to damage in central and peripheral tissues and subsequently programming disorders early for later in life. Oh that's, my gosh. That's the term that that's the exact term that they use quoted. So just going out on a limb here, if I'm understanding you, you're saying that there's a, a, a possibility that just the, the sheer volume of this stuff that's being used is tied to the massive increase we're seeing in the numbers of people with all of these issues, with like obesity and diabetes. So and many things we talk about. It's, it's not going to hit for a big headline or for a big hot take. Right. But it's one of these multifactorial things, particularly how our society and lives and what we're exposed to has changed so much over the last like 50 years. It's one major factor. Man. But yeah, you're looking at everything from possibly carcinogenic, then neurological. I read that whole list of neurological issues. In particular, I think what's important is ADHD in kids. Okay, now you're looking at endocrine from a standpoint of not just hormonal, like we talked about low sperm counts and early puberty, but also blood sugar regulation related to obesity and diabetes. So you're covering a pretty wide swath of potential issues, issues that have been documented, some inconclusively, some, there's some conflict. There's a huge issue with what levels are we looking at? All those things. Right. But again, there's a whole lot of smoke here. And, and so many of those things, I mean, like anything that's going to increase obesity is also likely to increase cancer risk and dementia risk and, uh, ASCVD risk and all those other things. So it's, it, it, spirals out of control yes. pretty quickly. And it also makes it harder to unwind that spiral in the sense of what is the cause. Man. And so I think ultimately with a lot of these things, there is no exact central cause. 
we're, there's so many issues. So you're everything from you've been exposed to pesticides to phthalates in your, in plastics and bisphenol A to, you know, what we're breathing in through the air to chemicals and processed foods. So you're adding all of these things together and yeah, it manifests in ADHD in one child. It manifests in nothing for somebody else. And one adult, it's it's manifests in Alzheimer's. There's just such a wide range of, and then, you know, and again, it's very hard to, because ideally, I mean, what what's really, what's the limit to this research? You can't have a study where you say, okay, right. we're going to give a hundred of you pesticide, <laughs> over limit pesticide diets. Yep. And we're going to give another hundred of you pesticide free. And we're going to compare you 20 years from now. It, that's ideally what you would do, right? That's what you do with animals. Yes. That provides some clue as to what's going on. But when you start trying to correct it for levels yeah. and things like that, let alone the metabolic differences, let alone all the factors that yeah. we talk about, it's very difficult. Yeah. And, and even if I'm trying to eat organic food in my own life, you know, or my, my kids, they go to school and they eat a school lunch. Sure. And who knows whether that's organic or they go to sports and some mom brings fruit for everybody and who knows what's in that. Or mm -hmm. maybe you stop at um, a restaurant and you get a salad and it's a nice sit down restaurant and it's a nice salad, but who knows? Who yeah. knows if the person cleaned it properly, if it was organic to begin with. So there is, there is, <laughs> there's no way to do that study and there's really no way to even properly fully eliminate it from our own diets, even if we really wanted to. Yeah. And I think too, that was maybe something I was going to touch on later, but I think yeah. that's a great, great way to sum it up. Um, you don't have to worry about that one soccer game. You okay. don't have to worry about that one. You know, you go out to eat three times a week or whatever. I, to me, the issue is what can you control within mm. a realistic framework of your life? And I know for me, not everybody can buy organic. I don't buy organic from top to bottom. I do eat out. I, my kids do. I, I allow them to have the, the treat after their baseball game. But what I can control a little more easily is the fruit in my house. Sure. Those kind of things. I can make that decision and know that I'm limiting exposures. We're talking about chronic exposures. We're talking about the levels um, that then you can eliminate a huge percentage of that because for every two times you eat out between the fruits and vegetables and like we've talked about meat and different things in the house, if you have that a little more under control, at least under your own roof, you're going to make a bigger difference than, oh, you know, you cannot eat, you cannot, if it's not labeled organic, you cannot have that snack after baseball. It's going to drive you crazy. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I didn't mean to take you off track. No, no. I think it was a good, good time to touch on that. And yeah. Okay. So Keep going. What do I, yeah, I, I you're think on a roll. Also, um, what's kind of important just to understand about the limitations of studies um, in this case, and I touched on it before, there are, there are critical inactive ingredients and they're not really looked at here because what's the pesticide? It's glyphosate. It, it's a pyrethroid or whatever. That's what's evaluated. That's what the studies are done on in animals or whatever. But then you've got these surfactants. You've got these other inert ingredients and then how do you study those individually? Or how do you make a determination whenever that, that inactive ingredient is in, I keep hitting it, but glyphosate or Roundup, but it's not in the, py, in the pyrethroid. So right. it, it's not like these are the same inert ingredients. You've, you, there's a whole cascade of substances, chemical substances that are added to these pr end products that are ultimately used that we know little about and that make it more difficult to study true end effects. Okay. Yep. And just to layer that multiple pesticides, it's not like you've just got one and you right. can narrow you. You've got, you've got a, you've got layers of pesticides with layers of inactive ingredients. And then somehow we're supposed to parse them out and figure out exactly which ones are okay. And which ones are not. It's, it's very difficult. Um, there was a, a researcher, um, at Cal Berkeley that said, we really need to be looking at the whole swimming pool of chemicals that we're exposed to related to food. That's a lovely idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> swimming pool of chemicals. <laughs> swimming pool. But that just, just, I like that term yeah. because of the scope of it. Yeah. It, and it, it's it, everywhere. I, I kind of like that. It's it all is, mixed in. You can't, yeah. You can't separate the chlorine out from the water. It's all in there. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Okay. Okay. So I'm super depressed. I don't want to be in a swimming pool of chemicals. I'm done eating vegetables and fruit. <laughs> I, I was going to touch on that. That that's a good point to bring up. I would be remiss to not say that the the benefits, the health benefits of eating fruits and vegetables, still greatly outweigh these risks. 
The health benefits of fruits and vegetables are known at many levels. You don't have to go into those. There are some detriments to pesticides that we also know of, but less strongly so. Right. And we have a way to control the vast majority of those issues Potentially, I know it's not available to everyone at every time, right? But that organic is a one broad stroke you can make um, from a decision standpoint, particularly on fruits and vegetables. I, I wouldn't say that you know if you're um, not buying organic pasta and buying organic potato chips and every level of your house is organic that you're not you're not doing the right thing. Okay, when decisions are being made, I feel like the most critical one um, related to the pesticide issue is produce. Sure. And then, like we talked about in a prior episode, meats relative to hormones. Got it. Different reasons, but organic is not the be-all, end-all. It's not perfect. That does give you a nice blanket that you can kind of cover that those concerns with. Okay, so I still need to eat fruits and vegetables. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, and and does that then mean as well that, just for the sake of argument, if if going organic is out of my price range because everything is expensive mm -hmm. and organic is ultra expensive. Um, do I hear you saying disregard this to the extent that you need to eat the fruits and vegetables first, and then as you can move into the organic realm? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, ideally in a perfect world, you, you've got a kitchen pantry full of these things and a fridge full of these things. I, I get it. I, mine is not totally full. I, I get it. Sure. But if you're prioritizing them, I think the most important thing you can do um, is produce. Got it. And then from there, um, th there are lists that I, I don't think this list is necessarily perfect, but it's pretty significant and it's just a general guide. Mm -hmm. Um, if from there a little more nuance is helpful, I have young kids. I understand that there are certain fruits that they love and they'll love them for a whole week. Yeah. And then after that <laughs> they will rot and then yes. you have to switch fruit. So yes. the, within those nuances, um, there are some that have been shown and there's some themes in within here, but there are some fruits and vegetables that have been shown to have more contamination with pesticides. These are just residues um, that have been measured. Um, and then there are others that have shown to have less. Okay. So in terms of that, we'll start with the bad and then go to the good. Okay. Strawberries, spinach, kale, and collard greens, grapes, peaches, pears, apples, uh, blueberries. So there's for me and my kids, there's a lot of heavy hitters in there. Yeah. I eat a lot the, of those. The, the dirty list is harder. Yeah. So you keep beating the nail over the head where you can go organic. It's more important than potentially where we get to the, to the clean list. Um, avocados, for example. And you can kind of see why there's a big shell on the outside of an avocado. So the part that gets hit with the pesticide ostensibly I'm not eating that. Yes. And again, they're porous and there's some absorption, all those things we're just comparing on a relative scale. Right. Okay, so the things that, that you eat the outside of tend to be more pesticide-centric. True, Okay. Yes. What yes. are some other things that are less, uh, less susceptible to that? Bananas? So on the list, somehow bananas was not on it. That's a little surprising. I, whenever I looked, they had like a, not an honorable, honorable mention, but they gave a little bit longer than the buzzword, like top, top 15 or whatever. Right. And bananas were on there just a little lower. Again, it could just have to do with the porous nature of them or how they're farmed. They're obviously, you know, farmed and produced in massive, massive quantities, even relative to other fruits. But, yeah. um, so the clean 15 avocados, corn, pineapple, onions, again, we've kind of, we're kind of dealing with a shell yep. on all these papaya, peas, honeydew, um, cabbage, a little surprising watermelon, um, mushrooms, which is interesting, mangoes, sweet potatoes, carrots. So again, that can at least, again, if you're trying to even dig, dig one level deeper and say, Hey, I'm within organic produce choices. This can at least give you a pretty, pretty basic guide. And in terms of, um, relative to each other, I think pretty solid science between what they determined, um, based on the levels and how much, um, they looked at, they found over, they tested for over 209 different types of pesticides. Wow. Over 209 were found on, on those dirty dozen items. So, and this is, and you're pulling this from, is this the environmental working group? Yes. The, they do the, the dirty dozen and clean 15 every year. Yes. Okay. And it tend it changes a little bit, but it seems to be consistent themes every single year, mm -hmm. the same sort of thing. Okay. Lovely. All right. So don't eat the outside of a pineapple check. Not a problem. <laughs> uh, definitely try to get organic spinach because I put huge handfuls of that straight into my smoothie every morning. Um, 
does, can I trust it when it says that it's pre-washed or should I double check that anyway? I would definitely still wash them. Okay. Yeah. I mean, at the very least running water actually is a little better than like soaking because there's just at least some agitation to get those things off. I, I I didn't go through and like parse all the different forms because there's, there's still going to be some exposure. Right. Um, and, and it's controversial because then some of them, you know, you do that, for example, to a raspberry or a blueberry, you have it in baking soda or whatever it is, then you've really kind of degraded the quality of what you're eating. And then does that backfire? So I'll let you kind of make your decisions on that. I would say wash them. And I would say if you're even just using water, you're in pretty good shape. Okay. All right. So, well, I, I, I feel like I'm already, I still feel like I'm swimming in a chemical pool bathtub. <laughs> uh, this is horrifying. Um, my, again, honey, I know you're watching. I'm sorry. I was wrong. I was very, very, very wrong. Um, I have been the, the holdout on so many of these things for so long, just because, you know, and it is hard to feed a family. It's hard to feed a family of uh, six, it's hard to feed a family of six healthy fruits and vegetables that they will eat and not rot. Um, and then when you factor in on top of that, okay, now you got to make it organic. It's rough, man. It's just so much. Uh, Um, having a list like that is helpful to at least know where we need to prioritize and put some extra effort. It's, it's worth the time and effort. Yeah. Because uh, along those lines, it is expensive to eat that way. It is problematic to, if you maybe go so far to not allow certain fruits in your home even, or whatever the case may be. I just know when it's for me and my kids, if I can make those decisions as much as possible, not correcting for the after baseball games and for the nights out and things like that. Cause I, I really don't think that that type of extreme is necessary. Yeah. I, I really don't because we're, we're still dealing with kind of a cumulative effect of issues. Now, if you've got a child with some neurological concerns, um, potentially maybe you're on the fence. So you're going to get an ADHD test or diagnosis. I get it. You want, you want to, you want to really kind of batten down the hatches in that regard. Go for it. Yeah. There's no downside to doing that. Um, I know there's some financial concerns, of course, but there's no sure. downside to going the other way. Yeah. So if ultimately here, I, I can't prove that X, Y, Z level and, and like pin this down for you, but I, I, to me, it still just gives a clear overall picture. Um, again, just related to all of the exposure that we have. Um, and if we know certain things, you know, maybe the plastic bottles, things like that, we know organic is at least eliminate some pesticides. We know potentially some organic and, um, you know, hormone free or ho- horm- no hormones added right. meat, um, can be just ways to begin to limit some of those things. And, and I think when you're dealing with kids, the younger they are, I think it changes their parameters versus if it's maybe you and your wife or, and you know, middle-aged at home. I think that those, that the stakes change a little bit. And sure. I think that can help at least make some of those decisions. Absolutely. If I have, um, if I'm, I'm concerned about this, I know that I've been exposed. What are some things, is there anything I can do supplement wise to increase my abilities, my body's ability to process some of this stuff out and, and get rid of it? Yeah. In a broad sense. Okay. You know, I, I think I w- sometimes related to questions like that. It's a very good question. There are definitely some things you can do to help. I just always try to make sure it's not tied to like, well, this is going to clear pesticides. Yeah. You t- that's, this is the we, anti-glyphosate. Exactly. We right. try not to do that. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. You know, so, but there's overall supplements really that have to do with methylation. So good quality forms of B vitamins, the basics, support for your liver. Um, if there maybe if you're more concerned or you've got some other things going on, or maybe liver support is needed, um, things like milk thistle from an herbal standpoint, but otherwise vitamin C, um, is always going to help your liver and help to increase glutathione, just help your body to detoxify overall. Yeah. Why is that the anti glyphosate? No, but does it help your body to process maybe a med that you're taking? the environmental exposures you're getting from a plastic bottle yep. from many other sources from, you know, fish and potential mercury, all those things. Um, it's not the, the antidote for any of them, I don't believe, but it's overall just making your body as efficient as possible. There are definitely differences with how individuals process and eliminate these things. Like we talked about, it's documented with kids because we understand that their liver is not quite as fully formed. 
Um, it's another, some of the enzymes aren't being produced in the same amounts, et cetera. So that's a little bit easier to document. And differences within individual adults are multifactorial, but overall, those basic types of supplements are going to help you at a, at a macro level to process and eliminate better. So you said liver support, milk thistle, vitamin C. Uh, and B vitamins from methylation. B vitamins, that's Absolutely right. good for detoxification. And especially because we are dealing with a lot of concern here with neurological issues, methylation definitely is a big part of that. Makes sense. Well- once again, I'm sorry, honey. Uh, this episode has been super exciting. Um, <laughs> any of the products that we mentioned are available on our website. Uh, that website is askjoedematteo.com. A-S-K-J-O-E-D-I-M-A-T-T-E-O.com. That's where you can find the products. That's where you can sign up for a mailing list. You can uh, find past episodes of this show. The, the episode, I think it was 43, that was dealing with... Um, uh, meat and dairy, uh, subjects. Um, you can find episodes of the show that started all this, the Ask Joe DiMatteo show all there on our website. Go check that out. Any of the uh, studies that were referenced and there were a lot of them. I'm looking at the list now it's long. Uh, those are all available in the show notes. So down in the description of wherever you're listening to this or watching it, all those links are down there. Don't take our word for it. Double check it yourself. Um, if you like this, if you got something from it, give it a like or a thumbs up or a, a five-star rating, write a review, leave a comment. If you've got some ideas or, um, some, some tips or tricks you use for cleaning your vegetables or how to avoid those sorts of things, we need that stuff. Drop that in the comments down below. Uh, and please share the show with someone, you know, and love that needs to hear these things. Maybe my wife should have shared this show with me years ago. Uh, but it didn't exist. So here we are now. All right. Uh, big thanks as always to Josiah Schweinberg, our engineer extraordinaire. There it is. There it is. <laughs> Michael Depish, the editor, Joyce Gibb, our nurse practitioner. She's a big fan of the dirty dozen and the clean 15. Uh, Diane Silverman manages our products. Big thanks to her. Terry does scheduling. Cecilia does distribution. That's Joey DiMatteo. I'm Tyler Andrews, and that is it for us this week. Thank you so much, guys. We'll see you next time. <laughs>